together. Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded. Amen. Pass the mic on to Pastor Ben for the sermon. Please be seated. Good morning, church. Good morning. It's great for us once again to be in the house of the Lord and asking the Lord to feed His lambs. We are His lambs and we want to be fed by His Word today. We have worshipped Him in songs and now we worship Him with the reflection of our hearts according to His Word. I want to speak on this topic on living a fulfilled life today. And I want to speak on this topic because increasingly, I find myself interacting with people, church members, uh, members of the public or friends uh, who seem to be living increasingly unfulfilled lives. Unfulfilled lives that may have resulted perhaps from a misunderstanding or a slightly uh, skewed understanding of what fulfillment means in life, and because of a misunderstanding of what brings us fulfillment, has resulted in undesirable consequences in some failed marriages, lives of sadness and anger, And perhaps some of us are finding ourselves in such situations. So we want to rediscover what does Jesus say about what it means for us to live fulfilled lives. What does Jesus say about what it means for us to live lives that seems to be full, perhaps not of things of the world, but full in our hearts because we know we are doing right before God. And that's what we're looking at from Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 27. And so, let me read that for us. Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 27. Uh, The top of the slide says 28, but I will end at 27. So this is Jesus foretelling his death and resurrection. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer Many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of men. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life would lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what? Will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. There was a young adult a number of years ago. His name was Augustine. And he sought to find fulfillment in his life, early on in life. He sought to find fulfillment through various ways that he would try to experience life, life to its full. He tried experiencing all kinds of earthly pleasures. He slept around. He indulged in theatres or what we would perhaps now see as movies or Netflix dramas. And he tried to experience many things like competitions and all that. And yet he found in experiencing all these that he could not find any long-term fulfilment in his life. 
And so later in his life, he would write a book called Confessions. This is St. Augustine of the 5th century. And he wrote, In my public life, I was striving after the emptiness of popular fame, going so far as to seek theatrical applause, he acted, entering poetic contests, he was a poet, striving for straw garlands and the vanity of theatrics, theatricals and intemperate desires, he slept around. I sought for pleasures, for honours and truth, and I fell thereby into sorrows, troubles and errors. You would think that the last sentence he would say, and I discovered true happiness and joy. But no, he said, I fell thereby into sorrows, troubles and errors. I wonder whether it's so different in our day now from the 5th century. In this book, Morality by Jonathan Sachs, Jonathan Sachs is a uh, Jewish rabbi, uh, who was a lecturer in philosophy as well uh, in the UK. For 20 years, he was a chief rabbi in the UK, uh, and he is a renowned author, uh, wrote a number of books, and one of the leading um, theologians or one of the leading commentators on public theology in our day. And so he wrote in this book, in the very first chapter, of how in our time right now, we are finding that we are increasingly able to do many things. We are able to shop uh, a lot more easier than the days past. In the past, you would have to go to uh, physical stores, but now you can, if you click on a uh, button in his app, he can bring shopping to his doors and goods will be delivered to him. He wrote about how many people are finding travel a lot easier these days. In fact, just last weekend, right? Half a million of Singaporeans were in Malaysia. I was in Batam and I felt as if the other half a million of Singaporeans could have been in Batam. Social media brings us information, it gives us connectivity, uh, it, and it gives us all kinds of pleasure. Knowledge. We're able to find knowledge at the tips of our hands and at the tips of our fingers uh, so easily nowadays. You can buy books off the cuff immediately in Kindle and the phrase, in, as you go to the Kindle store, the uh, phrase says there, read it now because you no longer need to go to the store and then bring the physical book before getting to a place that you can read. If you buy it now, you can read it now. You can get knowledge immediately if you want to. In fact, even if you don't want to buy a book, you can go to the National Library uh, app, uh, Libby, in, enter your uh, library username and password, and you can read books for free off the Libby app. You can Google, and information is there for you immediately. You can go to ChatGPT and ask, ChatGPT, tell me a dead joke. And ChatGPT will tell you a dead joke immediately, and it sounds as bad as typical dead jokes that I would say. Poverty has been alleviated. There is less hunger in the world. There is less illiteracy in the world. Many people are beginning to be able to read and write more. Premature death has also fallen in the world. Perhaps not in recent months or years because of the wars that are happening. But generally, there's less premature death. And so, Jonathan Sachs would write, on the face of it, we could not be in a better place. It seems as if we are in a better place with all these things that we said earlier being easier and safer. But yet, Jonathan Sachs says, on the face of it. And it hints at a darker truth, isn't it? On the face of it. He would go on to write that in fact, there has been a doubling of drug overdose in the US in the past decade. And if you compare the statistics over 20 years, it's been a tripling of drug overdose. Life expectancy overall, although less premature death, life expectancy is falling. 
Why? Because of wars and because of suicides. Alcoholism is on the increase and affecting younger and younger people. Suicide rates are up 33% in the last 20 years. Drug abuse has quadrupled in 10 years in Britain. He quotes a Pew Research that writes about how 70% of 13-year-olds to 17-year-olds say that anxiety and depression are serious issues in their generation and amongst their peers. In 2017, 13% of teenagers experienced at least one depressive incident. 20%, that's one in five girls, of 14 year olds say that in Britain, uh, in Britain self-harmed in 2017. And that's pre-COVID, right? And so we do not know whether in the COVID days it has gotten worse or not, and likely so. These are all in Britain and US. How about Singapore? Well, on a, in a report dated, what's that? Date of the report, 1st of July, 2023, CNA reported that 25.9% uh, 25 .9 increase from 2021 in the number of suicides in Singapore. And that increase in suicides has increased across all age groups, but particularly among the young and the elderly. And it writes that suicide is a leading cause of death for youths aged between 10 to 29, for the fourth year running. Our youths are not dying because of natural causes, but for the fourth year running, suicide is the leading cause of death. Amidst all these earthly benefits and pleasures that we can have now in our time, it does seem as if something is still not right. And so Jonathan Sachs in that chapter, the very first chapter of his book, concludes in that section these words, We may have won the battle for life and liberty, but the pursuit of happiness still eludes us. How then do we live a life that feels fulfilled, even if we don't have happiness from these earthly things? Well, we are looking at Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 27. Let me give some background to this section in Matthew chapter 16. Just before these verses that we read, well, Matthew, uh, Jesus had brought his disciples, the three closest disciples of his, to this place called Caesarea Philippi that you would see on the screen uh, in the picture. It is a place called Banias in the Old Testament. We have talked about it before in one sermon. It is a place where uh, in Banias they worship a pagan god and this cave that you see is like an entrance to Sheol, entrance to hell. And yet at this place where they are worshipping the idol of hell, uh, praying for good health that he will not come and get them. Uh, there is a uh, altar of sorts uh, that people will go and worship, and out of this place float living water. It seems as if it's a contrast between a place where it's an entrance to where hell is, and yet at the same time, you know, if you live your lives right, uh, then there will be a, then there will be streams of living water that will fill your life with life. And so it is at this place that Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the son of God. You are the son of God. At this place, Peter answered Jesus, you are the son of God. The son of God who had done many great miracles, the son of God who surely has the power to do all things, the Son of God, who is surely able to live a life of His own choosing, fulfilling, uh, to live a fulfilled life, as it were, at His own choosing. And here, being affirmed that He is the Son of God, we read in Matthew 
that this is what Jesus told his disciples thereafter in how he would live his life, a life of his own choosing, a life of how he would live a fulfilled life. From that time on, Matthew records, Jesus began to show his, his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and not live a life of pleasure, and not live a life of happiness, as it were, and not live a life of full, uh, full of things, as it were, but to suffer. To suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. It would be the first of four times that Matthew records in his gospel of Jesus saying that he must suffer. Immediately after he's been affirmed, as it were, as a son of God, able, someone who is surely able to live a life of his own choosing, to bring fulfillment to his own life, Jesus begins to say he must suffer. And so Peter took him aside, and Peter began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, you of all people, the Son of God, you who can live a life the way you want to choose it, far be it from you that you will choose to suffer, Lord. And I can imagine why Peter is saying this, right? Because Peter is his disciple. And if my master, who can do all things, decides that he wants to suffer, oh no, me as a disciple, what am I going to do? I would have to suffer together with him. And so Jesus says of him that you are setting your mind on the things, you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of men. Jesus tells him the way you are thinking is how men would think. It's how you would think. The way you are thinking is the way in which men think. And it's natural, right, for you and me, men, women, humans, to think of a fulfilled life as one being one of glory, one of honour, uh, one of comfort, one of security. It's typical, it's easy for us to think that way because that's what we humanly would crave for. We don't think naturally of a fulfilled life as one of suffering. We think of one as a fulfilled life as one of comfort, of security, and of pleasure. But notice what Jesus says here. Jesus says that that is the things in some other uh, Bible translation, these are the thoughts of men. But generally, it's the things of men, the thing that we think about, the things that we would crave for, the things of men. And that's how men think. But in doing so, we're not setting our minds on the things of God. And then Jesus would go on to tell his disciples, if anyone, not just Peter, not just John, not just James, if anyone, and that includes you and me, if anyone would come after Jesus, and what must we do? We must deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. Anyone, Jesus says, not just his disciples, but all who would come and follow Jesus would need to deny ourselves the things in which we think uh, of men, of what we would usually associate with as uh, would bring fulfillment in our lives, we have to deny ourselves. And to think the way God thinks and take up our cross and follow Him. For anyone or whoever would save his life, a sense of prioritizing our lives, anyone who would prioritize our lives would in a sense lose it. But whoever loses our lives or prioritizes what God would have intend for our lives, for His sake, for, God, for Jesus' sake, would find it. And so a New Testament scholar would summarize or would explain what Jesus meant by this, by saying, Jesus is not saying that anyone who concentrates on his own selfish concerns will be punished by having his life taken from him. But rather, Jesus is saying that by the very fact that he concentrates on his own selfish concerns or things of men, that person has lost life 
in the best and the fullest sense. In a sense, we will get what we want if we prioritize these things. But it is not the fullest life that we can live inside of what God thinks of our lives. We are living the second best life and not the best kind of life that God intends for us. Michael Wilkins says, we may exist, but we do not live. We may exist, but we do not live fully. In a sense, we will get what we want, earthly pleasures, if we want to uh, focus on our career, we will get, you know, what we want. If you focus on monetary gains, we will get what we want, yes. But ultimately, what Michael Wilkins is saying, what Jesus is saying, is that what we get will still not be the greatest fulfillment that we can have in our lives. It reminds me of what my wife used to say to me. My wife used to say, sometimes we have to give up what we have in order to have the best. Sometimes we have to give up what we have already in order to have the best. And that's what Jesus is saying. And that's what Michael Wilkins is saying. We need to perhaps reorientate what we feel or what we know or what we desire as what will bring fulfillment to our lives. For what will profit a man if he gains the whole world? All the things that we can gain in this world, what will it profit us if we would forfeit our soul? What shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father and then repay each person according to what he has done. And so if what we have done is to gain earthly things, earthly wealth, earthly pleasures, then we would have already received it, but yet we have gained nothing for life eternal. And so someone would say that disciples today, likewise, often do not grasp that our present perspectives, our present sufferings are actually not worthy to be compared of to compare with the future glory that Jesus would bring as he comes. If we were to focus rightly on what brings true fulfillment. And all that hinges on these very words in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, that we would deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. It hinges upon the attitudes that we have in how we view life, in how we view our lives as we live it. Are we willing to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Him? And sometimes, a commentator says, uh, we minimize these words by saying that, you know, we all have our crosses to bear. It seems as if, you know, the sufferings uh, in this world uh, this, mind, this discomforts that we have in this world, we just have our cross to bear and we just live life like that, willing to bear the discomforts in our lives, but actually not taking up our cross in a deeper way, not taking up our cross and willing to walk in a way of denial, of the way of Christ, and in a way of suffering. We are minimizing the discomforts in our lives by saying that's just something that we have to go through in life. But actually, my focus is still on all these things to minimize the discomforts, but to want to live a life of earthly pleasure. But rather, Jesus was speaking about a whole new way of life, a way of self-sacrifice, the very death to what we want, but to follow what Christ desires and wants. To deny all forms of self-seeking because these are the things or the ways of men, but to rather live a life in a way in which reflects the things or the ways of God. And then the cross is something that we find ourselves also difficult to take up. 
What does it mean to take up the cross of Jesus? What does it mean to follow Jesus in taking up his cross? Some of us feel that in following Jesus means as Jesus walks his life, as Jesus uh, begins to uh, work in my life, I would just follow him in terms of reading the Bible, in terms of uh, you know, follow what the church uh, would want us to do uh, in serving and all that. But there is a deeper way of life as we seek to follow Jesus. Because Jesus went to the cross in following the Father's will for him in order to give his life fully for the sake of others. That is the way of Jesus. And therefore, if we are to follow the way of Jesus fully, it is to follow his attitude, the way he lived his life in being willing to go to the cross, taking up that cross of his, to be willing to suffer for the sake of others. Again, Michael Wilkins says, self-preservation in the present life leads ultimately to self-destruction, while self-denial leads to ultimate self-fulfillment. There's a sense that, you know, we want to still follow Jesus, but at the same time, okay, still enjoy this and still enjoy that. Yes, we are following Jesus, but we're still accumulating others in that self Fulfillment in itself, giving to ourselves. And so, how then do we deny ourselves to take up our cross? Bishop Solomon says, the world tells us, just do it. But we keep telling one another and keep telling the world, don't do it. There's a sense that the world wants us and draws us towards earthly pleasures and earthly desires and earthly things. But we have to deny ourselves. And Bishop Solomon goes on to say, our unwillingness to relativize our affections, agendas, and accumulations, our unwillingness to put all these affections, agendas, and accumulations in light of what Christ wants for us, keeps us from truly being able to follow Christ. And so ultimately, living a fulfilled life, as it were, in following Christ's example, is to give of ourselves just as Jesus gave of himself, not for ourselves, Jesus did not go to the cross for his own sake, but for others, for the sake of others in our lives. It is about giving of ourselves, not for ourselves, but for others, because Jesus gave of himself, not for himself, but for others, for our sakes. And so for us to be able to live a life as it were in following Christ, in a kind of fulfilled life that Christ himself was, it was that Christ himself chose we have to give of ourselves not for ourselves but for others how do we give of ourselves for others though and so if we look at bishop solomon's uh, statement once again our unwillingness to relativize our affections agendas and accumulations keeps us from truly being able to follow Christ. And perhaps here in this statement, Bishop gives us some handles in how we can once again prioritize our affections, our agendas, and our accumulations in the way in which Christ would want us to live out our lives for. Affections is our relationships with others. In our relationships with others, how do we give of ourselves for others and not for ourselves? I can think of examples in marriage. Tim Keller says marriage is a way in which God has given for us, an instrument in which God has given for us to help us in our sanctification. It helps us in our growing in what it means to walk in the way of Christ. And so the way of Christ is our self-giving of ourselves for the sake of others, and in a marriage then, it's about how the husband gives of himself to the wife in fulfilling the wife's needs and the wife in giving of herself to the husband in what the husband needs. Marriage is not about 
fulfilling our own needs, but in fulfilling our spouse's needs. Even if it requires for us to walk the way of Christ of suffering for the sake of our spouse. And in that, we grow to be what it means to be like Christ. Unfortunately, many a times when we go into the marriage, we look at marriage as one of which we can have our own wants, our own needs fulfilled. And if we don't get our own wants and our own needs fulfilled, we demand from our spouse. But if we look at it from a way of discipleship, if we look at it from a way of how do we live fulfilled lives, even in our marriages, it's about us giving of ourselves to our spouse rather than have our spouse give to us. And if both spouses can do so, then both will live fulfilled lives because they are giving of themselves to fulfill each other's needs in their marriages. What about parent and child affections? Parent and child relationships is about us giving naturally to our children. And I think parents know this a bit easier, right? Uh, my son is now in an NS and uh, we crave you know, to uh, help him to be able to get to the army camp that is now so far away. And we want to, in a sense, serve him, give of ourselves for him. But sometimes, can I say, as children, it's a bit less easy for us to think of giving of ourselves for our parents fully. And children, that's something that perhaps we have to learn. But how to serve our parents at Christ, as Christ would serve them, fully giving for ourselves to serve our parents. How about colleagues? Uh, it's difficult to think of going to work as giving for ourselves for our colleagues, isn't it? Perhaps that's the way of a fulfilled life. Not to see the work that we do as a way of fulfilling our own ambitions, our own wants, our own desires, but as a way of helping others even at work. I had worked in Hewlett Packard for nine years before becoming a pastor, as I told you. And early on in uh, my working life, I had already known that you know, God had called me to be a pastor one day, and one day I'll be a pastor. So I, was, so I told my bosses, I told all my colleagues that, you know, one day I'll be a pastor, and so I'm not here to want to climb the corporate ladder. You know, and I would go about my life in HP just wanting to help others. And they all didn't find me as a threat in any way. You know, and I enjoyed my working life with all my colleagues because they would not see me as a threat and you were like, hey, come, join me in this project. Hey, come, do this with me. Hey, come, do this with me. And I find myself growing, not just in the work that I was doing, but in the relationships that I have with others. And it was a fulfilled life, even in secular work for me because I knew one day, you know, I wouldn't be there working towards the managerial or general or what, GM position. Uh, and it was a fulfilled life for me in being able to celebrate the joys to celebrate the successes of others. What about in our connect groups and our ministry groups? What does it mean for us then to serve others, to give of ourselves for others, even in our connect groups and ministry groups? Perhaps in your CGs, this week, next week, you can think about that. How do we give of ourselves for others in living a fulfilled life, even within our CGs and ministry groups? And then Bishop Solomon talks about agendas. How do we focus? How do we order our lives with the right perspective of giving ourselves to others? How do we order our ambitions in giving of ourselves to others? And accumulations, accumulations of knowledge, of money, accumulation of material goods. How do we use all these to give of ourselves, not for ourselves, but for others? And can I drive it home a bit further? Jesus gave of himself, not just for his friends, not just for people who like him, but Jesus gave of himself even for his enemies, for the disciple who betrayed him, for those who accused him, and for those who beat him and even killed him. What does it mean for us to give of ourselves, not for ourselves, but for others, even 
our enemies. Let me close with what John Wesley would say about what is men. In a sermon that he preached on what is men, he writes and he says these words, Remember, you were born for nothing else. You live for nothing else. Your life is continued to you upon this earth. You are given still this life on earth for no other purpose than this, that you may know, love, and serve God on earth and enjoy Him thereafter to all eternity. It hails back to what we said earlier. Don't focus on just the things here because these will pass away, but rather on eternity. Consider you were not created to please your senses as Augustine was trying to fulfill himself, to gratify your imagination in seeking of knowledge, for example, to gain money or the praise of men, to seek happiness in any created good, in anything under the sun. All this is waiting in vain shadow, is leading a restless, miserable life in order to a miserable eternity. On the contrary, you were created for this, and for no other purpose, by seeking and finding happiness in God on earth, prioritizing what God desires, to secure the glory of God in heaven. Therefore, let your heart continually say, this one thing I do, having one thing in view, remembering why I was born and why I am continued in this life. Why do I still have life? I press on towards this mark. I aim at one end of my being, which is God even at God in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, that he shall be my God forever and ever, and my guide, even unto death. Even unto suffering, even unto death, our focus is on God, who in Christ is reconciling the world to himself. And so we are called to live a fulfilled life, by denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following Christ. That's how we find true fulfillment. That not only gives fulfillment here in this life, but in the life to come. Let us pray together. Church, as I was praying for this sermon, I have a distinct sense that there are some, if not many of us, who are feeling unfulfilled in our lives right now. And perhaps this unfulfillment in our lives requires a reordering of what we think and how we think of life. And so I do want to give us just a brief moment to ask God for ourselves, God, what do I need to change in my life today so that I live my life according to your ways? To be able to give of myself, not for myself, but for another. And perhaps even as we say that, the other person that you're supposed to Gift of yourselves too is coming to mind. Allow God to orientate your life so that you may find true fulfillment in Christ. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you gave of your life for us. You of all people who is able to live a life fully of your own choosing has decided to give of your life for not yourself, but for our sakes. And that is fulfilled life. 
that is a life that we are called to also follow in, denying ourselves and taking up our cross. And perhaps, Lord, as we do so, at the end of our lives, we can look back and say, indeed, we have lived a life fulfilled because we have, give of, we have given of our lives as you have done for the sake of others. In your reconciling the world to yourself, we have also done so in following our Lord and our Christ. But Lord, we know it's not easy. And so we ask for your Holy Spirit to come to remind us, to convict us, and to empower us. So that step by step, even in suffering, we can continue to focus on the things of God and not of men. To give of our lives for the sake of others. Denying ourselves, taking up a cross, and following Christ. Thank you a lot in Jesus' name. Amen.